Hi, and welcome. I want to title this one kind of the best of Bohr. Um, Bohr, his model of the atom does give me a little bit of frustration, and, and I know he didn't mean to. He was going with the best information he had, but he proposed that planetary model which is not, not true. We do not know how electrons move. All we can do is describe a region in space where we're 90% probability of finding an electron with a given energy. And that's what we're building up to. What I want to talk about in this video is the best of Bohr. What he proposed are that electrons are in energy levels, discrete energy levels, and not all of them are allowed. So we say they are quantized. So let's take a look at that. At that. He says electron clouds, um, th that region in space, are made up of energy levels. Now, there, those, the, these energy levels are much like the rungs of a ladder. But the difference is they are not evenly spaced. Electrons want to get as close to the nucleus as possible, so they want to maximize their attractions, but they also want to get as far away from one another as they can, and so they want to minimize repulsions. And that um, means that they're going to form these energy levels that are not evenly spaced. Um, the amount of energy possessed by electron is going to determine or explain to us, provide information about that electron's distance from the nucleus. These energy levels or energy shells are also going to help us understand the energy of the electron. So levels that are further from the nucleus are higher in potential energy. So we're talking here about potential energy. Potential energy in chemistry is all about those attractive and repulsive forces. So um, electrons like to hang out where they are um, most stable. That most stable state is where these attractions have been maximized and repulsions have been minimized. And this is called the ground state. Um, you can kind of think about it as the electron's home. I, I often refer to um, these electron clouds, these energy levels. Um, ultimately, I talk about them a little bit as an electron playground. I know some teachers and professors really bristle at using such terms. Um, as this. But what I like is to think about um, where the electron can play and move um, and still be in that stable state where they've maximized attractions and minimized repulsions. And so I think about a little bit as, as this electron playground. Okay. Now, electrons can gain energy and move away from their ground state. So if they gain a quantum of energy, that's a set given amount of energy, and they can gain or absorb that energy through um, sources such as heat or electricity or electromagnetic radiation, the electron will move up in energy, <coughs> excuse me, energy levels. It will move further from the nucleus. Okay, than it was in its ground state. And this is a process called excitation. And this excited state is very, um, I should have said excitation here, And this excited state is pretty unstable. It doesn't last very long. Electrons won't stay in their excited state forever. They will fall back 
um, to their ground state, and they will emit electromagnetic radiation instead of absorbing energy up here they're going to emit and this time it's always going to be electromagnetic radiation and we call this process relaxation <clears throat> the larger the fall or movement back towards the nucleus so this time in relaxation our electrons are moving back towards so excitation moves away relaxation returns <coughs> to their original ground state um, the electromagnetic radiation is released okay let's see a picture of that all right, this is an energy level diagram um, for Bohr's model. So um, we've got um, principal, we're going to call these N, and later on you'll see that's called the principal quantum number. It's our first way to describe that region in space where there's a 90% probability of finding an electron with a given energy. It'll be the first step towards that. So we're going to call that the principal quantum number. I want you to see that link when we get there. N can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so forth. And you notice that the further they get, this would be our nucleus down here. And the further electrons get from the nucleus, the closer these energy levels are to one another. So when electrons gain energy, they become excited. That's excitation. When electrons lose electromagnetic radiation, that's relaxation. So, <coughs> excuse me. The analogy that I like to talk about here is my my um, ground state is sitting at home you know on my chair wrapped up in a quilt with my little cat Nala I'm reading the comics and so that's my ground state but you know if I get a phone call you know I'm I'm right here near my little chair if I get a phone call and uh, you know it's Denzel Washington you can bet I am off that chair I'm gonna move away from my chair because I've gained all this energy from being able to talk to my idol I mean come on who wouldn't be excited talking about Denzel Washington talking directly to him and so I'm gonna be really excited and I'm gonna be pacing the room and I'm gonna be talking faster and and oh my gosh life is gonna be so exciting but you know, pretty quickly Denzel Washington's going to realize he has the wrong number. And, you know, I've got to give up that energy somehow. So I'll probably call my sisters and my husband and say, oh my gosh, Denzel Washington called me. But pretty soon all that energy is going to be released. And I'm going to go right back down to my ground state, my little rocking chair and read the comics and life will go back to normal. Um, somebody please get Denzel to call. Thank you. Okay, so this is what it's going to look like um, in a spectrum. So we would be, see what we call a line spectrum, discrete lines of electromagnetic radiation depending on the energy levels that an electron moves between. Okay, so each possible energy emission corresponds to a um, specific amount of energy so it uh, so I've got a difference in energy and that's going to correspond to a very specific energy of a photon so I like to talk about the absolute value of that difference in energy is the energy of the photon of light that is emitted. So that means that each different transition from you know 3 to 2, 5 to 2, 6 to 1 
Each one of those corresponds to a different wavelength of light. Some of those falls, you can think of them, can be detected. And those that end at n equal 2 are visible. We can see them. Others, we need special instruments. Now, here's where it gets really cool. So the energy for the energy levels, if I have, say, hydrogen, are not equal to the energy for those energy levels if I have something like fluorine. That's because hydrogen has one proton, fluorine has nine protons. So the electrons are more attracted to fluorine's nucleus. And so each energy level is different for the energy for each element. And that means those differences are of energy level is different for each element. And that means the energy of the photons will be different. And that means we're going to produce differing wavelengths of emission of electromagnetic radiation. And that's really cool because that means we basically have a fingerprint to identify the element in what results is we call, let's spell that, sorry, an atomic emission spectrum. We can identify using what's called a bright line spectrum. And that's what we're looking at. We're not looking at the absorbance. We're looking at the emission of light in a bright line spectrum. Okay? And so each element, these wavelengths of light that you're seeing, would be very different for each element. And let's take a look at this one. This shows just a simplistic view. You notice that lithium is very different than cadmium, is very different than strontium, and that's because their nuclear charges are different. All right, so we can recognize them. And if we have a mixture, we can identify what's in that mixture. So here, if I wanted to find out if lithium was present, I'd have to match up almost like, you know, if you see those DNA, um, you know, mapping. And so I see very clearly all of lithium's lines are showing up. But then when I get to cadmium, those two characteristic lines, none of cadmium's lines show up. So cadmium is not in the mixture. And if I looked at strontium, I can find strontium's lines. So I know that the mixture contains lithium and strontium. They do that one fairly overlapping line there. Okay, so we can identify elements by their bright line spectrum because structure determines function. So, okay, that is a lot of fun to me. I, I hope you enjoy that and I hope in your um, class with your professor or your teacher you get to see those really cool gas emission tubes it's just really kind of psychedelic and fun to do. Hope you enjoy that part of your journey in chemistry. And for my kiddos, this is, as always, signing off.